So I decided, I thought I'd present today on aphids. Um, I know something about them, but why else would you present about aphids um, besides the fact that they come up a lot in my work? They are another taxon through which we can look at life writ large because there's a lot going on and they exemplify lots of things about biology. And the, like they also exemplify the science of biology because the, the more you study, the more you find out. And um, they also reward time taken looking at them closely like a lot of smaller organisms. And most people are have some experience with aphids. They think they know what they are, whether they're scientists or citizens, but there's always something cool that you didn't know or something to discover about them. So first, a little bit of uh, biology, taxonomy. They are, uh, here's, from kingdom animal all the way down to insecta. They're insects in the order Hemiptera that includes all these critters, aphids, allies, but also true bugs, cicadas, same order. Um, plant parasitic mipterans are the Stenorinca, and within those, the aphidoidea. And then finally, we get down to uh, the aphids. There's 17 subfamilies within the aphids, which we won't enumerate here, and about 5,000 species of aphids. And this photograph of Ropolomyces um, lonicerae is what you may think of when you think of aphids, the large gathering of a uh, colony of aphids on, like this on a plant. They're dominant in intemperate latitudes. Um, they're actually uh, exhibit a reverse latitudinal gradient. So most biological taxa are uh, more abundant, more diverse. There's more species as you go towards the equator. And those of you who are going to Costa Rica are going to benefit from that on your trip. And that's why a lot of people go, biologists, to the equatorial latitudes because of the of the lower latitudes because of the diversity there. But aphids go the other way. There's more species north than there are south. Don't look for aphids so much when you're in Costa Rica. Look at some other stuff. And that diversity, temperate though it is, is like fantastic. There's all kinds of beautiful forms that all comes are, are within the aphids. Um, just grab some photographs from a source um, that I'll, I'll share with you at the end so that you can do this if you want to, just to see all the different uh, manifestations and variations on the aphid theme. The aphid theme, uh, some way to recognize them, there's a couple, um, they just look like a sort of nondescript small organism, especially if they're a little green one like that. You just say, okay, but notice on this one, there's a really good um, example here. These cornicles, these are called cornicles or siphunculi. Here's another one. You see those, you've got a you almost certainly have an aphid. They're also going to be relatively slow moving because they're not predators. They're feeding on plants. So there's the siphon siphunculus, um, a single one, siphunculi on both sides um, that you can use to recognize them. And then the rostrum here uh, indicates the unique way they feed on plants. So Looking a little more closely at that, uh, they have the, their mouth parts, um, which are derived from the primordial mouth parts of arthropods, have been modified into a shape like this that allows them to feed on plants by piercing and sucking. So the maxillae, which are mouth parts, are paired and they have a, a, a morphology that produces these canals. So this thing is like a straw. And then they have mandibles that can do some cutting that sheath that. And they feed on phloem. So if you're familiar with, it, familiar with the way plants are constructed, um, um, 
higher plants will have phloem. This is rich in nutrients and that's what they feed on. They pierce through all the other tissues until they find the phloem. Here's a, a section micrograph that shows the um, dissected aphid stylets after they have made contact with the phloem, which is the P here. And they don't care about these other cells. They probe them, work their way down, and can hit the phloem. It's very flexible, interesting organ. How do they do this flexing? Uh, there's a lot to be learned about that still. Uh, you may be aware that they um, exhibit live birth. They don't lay eggs, or they often don't lay eggs in their life cycle, as they'll show. And this is a little uh, clip. Is it going to work? Yeah, come on. So here's a little nymph. That's her mama, and uh, she's being born live right onto the plant. This live birth is. Uh, helps them to um, achieve really high population growth rate potentials. One reason, uh, here's, here's a mother with all her babies around her. And uh, because um, during this part of the life cycle, they're parthenogenic, there's no males. These are females and they lay, they, they, uh, lay other females. And that allows them to have just Two weeks and that's a generation and they're off, start the next generation after two, two weeks. So over a warm summer, they can really explode. And some species really take advantage of that, their life's history. They can also, because they don't have males and they don't need to mate, these babies already have embryos when they're born. So they're ready to start the cycle right away. They have two forms, many do. Non-winged, called alates. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it should be reversed. I thought I had this reversed. So non-winged are ap aptery, without wings, and the winged are alates with wings. And here's some photographs of the same species. This is one species. This is what its wingless form looks like. And here's what its winged form looks like. And here are two is another example, another species. The winged forms and non-winged forms, they look pretty different. They can look pretty different. You have to recognize them both. So um, these winged forms allow the aphids to move over great distances. They can go hundreds of miles in a few days if they get onto the wind currents and they often exhibit that behavior. It also allows them to move between their summer hosts and their winter hosts uh, so that they can be successful in temperate regions. And here's a typical life cycle for that. So that in the winter cycle, which is typically one generation, it becomes sexual. Now we have males and females. There they are. Male has got wings now, female does not. She lays an egg. Um, that egg hatches to produce a new winged form in the spring. The winged form flies to another host, the summer host, where there are many generations of parthenogenic with live birth. So that's the whole cycle of aphids. And many of them that you're familiar with uh, will have uh, if they're feeding on uh, something like a, a forb or something in your garden uh, in the summertime, in the wintertime, they have moved to a different host, usually a tree. And most, most species have this, what's called holocyclic um, life cycle. So one thing that's interesting and important about insect, about um, aphids is that they um, can transmit plant pathogens, especially viruses. So here's a figure from a review article showing how um, viruses that can affect plants can get between plants. There are many so-called unassisted ways where virus particles can go from plant to plant. And there are many assisted ways in which something gets them 
moves the particles. Among those, insects are really important. And you'll note that this drawing, uh, probably, I don't know what that is, but uh, I don't see siphunculi, so I don't think it's an aphid. But 80% of plant viruses require insects to get from one plant to the other. So this is a significant phenomenon in nature. Um, of those, 50% of all those are transmitted by aphids. So aphids are the big deal when it comes to moving viruses between plants. And a lot of that is attributable, again, to this interesting way they feed. They can get to the key tissues in a plant. Phloem tissue is often a target tissue for infection by viruses. Seem to be a little uh, a, a, a match made for, for this, and it's probably been going on for a very long time. There are a couple of different ways that uh, viruses can be transmitted by aphids. And here's a drawing of an aphid. Look, there's a siphunculus, so we must have an aphid here. And um, this is an animated cartoon showing the virus. And uh, the virus, in this case, is infecting the, all the tissues of the plant. Here are, here's the, uh, the aphid stylus and feeding apparatus car in cartoon. And these virus particles can attach to the tips of the uh, feeding stylet and, um, and then be transmitted to uh, the next host plant if the aphid moves from host to host. And I've found this um, little video. Um, uh oh, I don't want to hear that. Maybe I can mute it. Well, you better listen. So there's another way called persistent circulative viruses. Um, and the cartoon will show you that. So I've changed the particle shape, which is pretty representative. The particle in this case are ingested right into the aphid's uh, gut. They pass through the gut into what's called the hemocele, which is the the open blood system of all insects, and they pass through the hemocele and they pass then into the accessory salivary gland, that's this thing. So now they're in the saliva and at the next uh, feeding opportunity, they can um, enter uh, the saliva and infect another plant. Got another movie for you.
So you can see, I think, from those cartoons that the relationship between these aphids and the um, virus viruses are are intimate. And in the case of persistent viruses, like persistently transmitted viruses, often there's only one or two species of aphid that can transmit a particular virus. They are um, there's a lot of uh, interactions required for that virus to cross the gut membrane and into the hemocele and into the salivary glands. It's a very specialized react um, association, probably as um, they've been associated as uh, co-evolving species for a long time. And along those, consistent with that, um, there's some interesting effects of the plant pathogens including viruses on vectors. If these viruses, as I said, require trans aphids or insects for transmission, there should be a lot of selective selection, selective pressure on them to make sure that happens effectively. And we can interpret some of these observations in light of that. So uh, infected plants often are better for the uh, growth rate of the vector, more fecundity or lo greater longevity or even enhanced alate production that is producing more winged forms. And plant traits that have been associated with that are uh, plant defenses and nutritional quality. It can also affect the behavior. So infected plants can be more attractive to aphids or uh, encourage settling or change their feeding in ways that enhance transmission. Plant traits can be color, but also olfactory cues. Infected plants smell different, they taste different to insects in ways that can influence their, um, their behavior. And in fact, if we take a look at all the studies up until 2018 that has looked at this, there are um, a lot of examples of greater attraction or settling on infected plants, greater attraction or settling on non-infected plants. It's all the, in, uh, with viruses and semi-persistent and persistent, um, non-persistent and persistent viruses are all cataloged here in this figure to show the frequency with which these things have been observed. And uh, it gets a little bit different depending on whether it's persistent or non-persistent. You can maybe see some patterns here, but we can still kind of classify these effects of a virus on a, its vector on aphids uh, as being an honest manipulation of the vector or deceptive manipulation of the vector or conditional uh, influence effects of um, the pathogen on the on the vector or dynamic. All of those things then invite some interpretation from an evolutionary point of view. I just wanted to talk about conditional preference, which is, uh, I think, quite uh, interesting and more prevalent than you might think. So in this case, here's a picture of how the an experiment can be detected conducted where we've got an infected and non-infected plant and we can put some aphids in here and measure where they would like to go. They want to go to the infected plant or the non-infected plant. Give them 24 hour, hours to settle and the data are shown here where if the aphid does not have the virus, it's not carrying the virus, it prefers to settle on virus infected plants. But once the aphid acquires the virus, it prefers to settle on non-infected plants. I think you can appreciate how that potentially can accelerate transmission of the virus from one plant to the other. If you uh, manipulate the vector so that it attracted to infected plants when it doesn't have the virus, but once it acquires the virus, uh, it is now attracted to non-infected plants, as shown here. This is going to really accelerate the spread of the pathogen through a population of host plants. This is conditional preference. And I don't want to 
uh, get too complicated, but I just wanted to show um, that we can model what that means for spread of the virus with a model like this that incorporates these terms for how many host plants are infected, um, how many vectors are infected, the rate of transmission of the virus, the rate of acquisition of the virus, uh, the preference for infected hosts um, and of infectious vectors for infected hosts and the relative preference of non-infectious vectors for infected hosts. So this encompasses this whole conditional preference I uh, described. And then you can, when you run this model, you can see the spread of the pathogen through a plant population. And this just shows that uh, if you have this situation that I described a few slides ago, then the spread is much ra more rapid through a population of plants than if you have, um, for example, equal preference or in some strange situations uh, you might have. Um, so this is equal preference. This is reversed preference and this is the purple line is, is this guy here. So more than uh, this continues to be observed. This conditional preference was really first documented um, by us uh, probably 15 years ago. And now there are many systems in which this has been observed. So uh, that's kind of the end of the, the little vignette about um, aphids as transmitters of viruses. There's a lot of work on many frontiers now to understand how this happens, what are the implications, um, how this happens in the plant, how this happens in the aphid, and whether it, ma it makes sense in terms of being an ev evolved strategy of the virus and potentially co-evolved with the aphid for uh, virus fitness. So changing subjects just to kind of wrap up um, this overview. Um, aphids have many predators and most people are familiar with these, especially lady beetles. Um, if you see one of these on your plants in your garden, for example, look around, you just might find aphids in the next, on the next plant because they're very good at uh, locating aphids and uh, they are primary predators of aphids. Green lacewings are also predators of aphids and this is the adult and right about now, you probably have these flying around your home, I guess, but um, you can, uh, this is the larva. Um, and these pincers are very good at uh, taking aphids and draining them dry. There are aphid uh, midge larvae that attack them. There are parasitic wasps that attack them. And there are other general predators that uh, don't necessarily pursue aphids per se, but they will eat them. Even ground beetles, if aphids fall off plants, uh, they, uh, they run into these guys. And just a few photographs, uh, here's some aphids and uh, there is a larval ladybug. So this is actually the business part of adult Ladybug can eat a uh, hundred aphids a day, but um, sh she'll lay eggs and these creatures, her offspring will continue doing that as they develop. So they can uh, really decimate an aphid population if there's a bunch of these guys. And here's an example of a parasitic wasp. It's shown here uh, depositing an egg in this aphid. Um, it's um, will deposit a single aphid and its baby will develop in this aphid as a larva and then mature inside the aphid, produce what looks like a mummified aphid. And you can find these sometimes. So here's a mummified aphid. And this is a perfect circular trap door that was carved by the emerged uh, wasp that uh, has flown. So you can find these. If you've got an aphid infestation, you can find these 
And if you find them looking like that, uh, that means the wasps have been busy. And uh, if they're really busy, they can also decimate whole aphid populations. So there's a lot of interesting ecology like that. In addition to aphids being specialized on certain plants, transmitting viruses, they also have to cope with their natural enemies. There's some interesting life cycles in aphids too, like uh, these, um, this subfamily Pemphigini. This is a uh, Pemphigus aphid, and this is a gall. And if you have poplars, you may see these uh, swellings. And if you open up that, you will find aphids inside. So the females of this group of aphids, they can uh, stimulate somehow when they land, and this is not really known yet, they land on the leaf, they can stimulate changes in the growth of the leaf that causes a swelling that's hollow, and the aphids can live in there. In some species of Pemphigini, they even have specialized sisters. So some of the aphids uh, in this Gaul will be feeding away, and others become specialized as soldier aphids that guard the entrance to the gall against predators getting in there. Because if a predator got into a gall that's full of aphids, uh, it would not be uh, good news. And they're all um, related. In fact, they're all clones of one another because they were deposited by a, a single mother, and uh, they tend and 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 have developed into a colony. So you can imagine how soldiers could evolve because they're protecting the whole genotype. of, uh, And it's kind of like incipient social behavior, like we're used to thinking about happening with Hymenoptera. And they're ancient. Uh, they've been around for a long time. This is a one from amber, probably 200 million years before present. So it looks uh, like a modern aphid. The cephunculi look a little bit uh, subtle to me, but it's certainly an aphid. And um, this would mean that like so many taxa, the aphids passed right through uh, Chicxulub, uh, disaster <clears throat> with the uh, asteroid collision in the Triassic to Jurassic transition. Uh, I can also say that aphids can inspire. I, I hope that some of what I've said was inspiring, but can also inspire uh, art. And uh, I had the privilege of working with a, two artists to create an installation about aphids a few years ago. Uh, which we called Abundant. And these are canvases, watercolor canvases, um, that depict some of the things that come to mind when one thinks about aphids. They're prolific, and this is to illustrate that parthenogenic reproduction. Here's the mother with her babies inside, and uh, there they are, and they're shown with their little incipient uh, offspring in them. And they are adaptable, uh, both over evolutionary and ecological time, and resilient. So aphids are abundant. They're species rich, 5,000 species. Only a few of those are pests, but that's often why we know so much about aphids, because of the problems they can cause, including as vectors of important plant pathogens. They're almost everywhere on the planet where higher terrestrial plants can be found, but um, more abundant and diverse in temperate areas than uh, in tropical. They're critical parts of ecosystems wherever they go. Uh, I should have included some mention of their importance in the diet of uh, other organisms, uh, including birds. And like a lot of biological taxa that can be inspiring, get you thinking about bigger things, um, biology in general, uh, the excitement of it, and uh, what they can represent to us symbolically. 
So I'll close with this uh, picture of Aphis nerii with its beautifully black siphunculi and thank you. And I think we can go to the planned Q&A now.